Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Mastering GLSL in Touch Designer. My name is Lake Heckman, and I am leading this course. As I'm sure you all know by now, I'm a new media artist exploring how technology can alter human perception and how we interact with each other. And I do this through interactive installations and other large scale projects that use a lot of these GLSL techniques that I'm talking about to implement systems that are familiar and a lot of times derived from the natural world around us that I like to use in interactive ways to deepen human experience. Um, we are certainly getting there. We are now on uh, lesson 11, advanced image filtering. So we're gonna be talking a lot about convolution kernels and stuff like that today, uh, which I'm excited about because this is, in my opinion, one of the last main concept checkpoints that we got to do before we get into the really fun stuff uh, in 12, 13, 14, which is, yeah, like actually building some real, real stuff here. So without further ado, let's get into it for now. Image filtering with convolution kernels. So if you remember, uh, at the end of our last lesson, we talked about blurs and specifically about the box blur and how the box blur is an example of a convolution kernel based image filter. So that's the main topic for today, convolution kernels and image filters. So let's take a deeper look here and using the blur as an example again, really understand what's going on. So we can see on the left, we have the input image and on the right, the output image. I did take this from a website that has an interactive viewer I'm gonna pull up in a second. Um, but I think it's a great, a great, uh, example. So this red outline neighborhood here shows the cells or the pixels that our kernel is going to, to cover or to act upon. And here we can see the result of the kernel, the output of, uh, of the pixel. And it's pretty obvious just by looking that indeed we are blurring this image. Right. Um, so then here in the middle, we can see exactly what's happening from a mathematical perspective. These values in the squares are actually the pixel values in grayscale. Um, so you can see the 62 is the darkest and I guess 126 here is about the lightest. Um, and so each of these are the cells and we take that value. We multiply it by our weight. That weight is defined in the kernel itself. So we do uh, pixel value times weight, plus pixel value times weight, plus pixel value times weight, et cetera, et cetera. And the result of all of these weights is going to be one. Uh, and that is going to be how we arrive at this 95, which is the actual pixel value of our output image. And so if we apply that again, all over for every pixel on the screen, we get a blur. And so now I think it's a good time to take a look at that interactively. So here, this should look very familiar. It's exactly the same thing. And let's look at the blur kernel. So here there's a drop down menu and you can look at different types of kernels, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but actually, I think this is potentially the best one to look at right now to understand. And that's just the identity kernel. So the identity kernel is exactly that. It's just the identity. It will take the input image and it will output the input image. The reason for that is we can see values of zero, weights of zero for every cell that is in this kernel, except for the center. And so that means we're going to ignore all of our neighbors. We're going to take the current cell value, multiply it by one, and output that, which, shocker, is the exact as the input value. Um, so that's what the identity kernel is. So we can then, let's look at the blur. So here we have different weights. So this is, this is our kernel. Um, and the weights really make up the kernel itself. So here we're going to take our upper left neighbor, multiply that value by 0 0.0625, uh, which is one over 16. Um, 
So we'll do 1 over 16. This one is 1 over 8. 1 over 16. 1 over 16. 1 over 4. 1 over... Sorry, 1 over 8. 1 over 4. 1 over 8. 1 over 8. 16, 16. So 1 over 16 four times. That's uh, a quarter. Plus another quarter. That's a half. And then we have uh, an eighth four times, which is another half. And so that all adds up to 1. Uh, and so there we can now just like kind of drag our kernel around this image and see live how these different kernel values are multiplied by the different pixel values and result in uh, different outputs. Another one that I like a lot is the, uh, where is it at? We can just do the left so bell. And this is the beginning of an edge detection. So here, because it's a, a left so bell, we're, we're ignoring the top and the bottom. And we're looking, uh, so you can see we're taking 1 times the left, and then minus 1 times the right, 2 minus 2, 1 minus 1. If I go for a right so bell, those are flipped. And so if you think about it, um, if we take our upper left times minus 1 and our upper right times positive 1, and we add those two together, that's going to be essentially a measure for how much our image is changing over this pixel, right? If those values are very close together, then it means that the image changed quite a lot. If the values are very far apart in opposite directions, uh, that means that the image changed very little because it's being multiplied by different signs. And so this is edge detection. Because when we see um, values to the right and to the left of a given pixel or to the top and bottom of a given pixel that are drastically different, that implies an edge. And so if we look at the uh, bottom so bell, now you can see kind of like the horizontal edges and the top also horizontal edges. So. That's basically what a Sobel filter is. Um, an outline filter is kind of similar. Um, by looking at all of the, the neighbors, and it's also important to note, so here we have an 8 in the middle, right? And then we have 8 negative 1s. <coughs> so that all adds up to 0. Um, in the case of the blur, we're all adding to 1. And in the case of, let's say, like the sharpen, uh, we're also adding to one because we have a five, four minus one, so that adds to one. So it's important to know kind of what we're looking at because if we're looking for edge detections, we want zero to be the baseline. And so we want, um, we want our kernel to sum to zero and not to one. But if we're doing something more like a blur, then we want that to sum to one instead because we want it to be, um, What's the right term? It's kind of like conservation of mass. We care about conservation of mass when it comes to something like blurring, but not when it's something like edge detection, because edge detection, we're really creating like a brand new texture, um, as opposed to returning a slightly changed version of the input texture. And then uh, last down here, they have, um, another filter where you can actually come in here and change the kernel values individually, which really help you see what's going on. So let's go to like a left so bell. And if you change the weight, so as you can see, I'm basically like just removing by making these the same, completely removing the kernel effect or mostly removing the kernel effect. And if I were to make these like drastic, then we're going to see only very harsh edges. And then obviously we go back to the original. Um, we get our normal, uh, in this case, left so bell. So that's what an image kernel is. I hope that makes sense. I hope this interactive viewer is helpful. The link is in the description. Definitely go play around with it a little bit yourself because it is really important intuition to have. And this is one of the best examples um, that I've seen. So back to our slides, other types of common kernels are the sharpen, 
box blur, which we talked about, emboss, edge detection, which is the Sobel filter, motion blur, Gaussian blur, there's a bunch of other ones. And now talk a little bit more about how kernels are implemented. Uh, so this is basically what that other uh, interactive viewer was showing us, but in a little bit more of a textbook fashion. So here in the top uh, image on the right, we can see the kernel, which is then overlaid on an image. So every element of the kernel is associated with a specific pixel of that image. And that kernel is then used to transform the information from an array of pixels on the input image to a single output uh, pixel in the output image. So that's exactly what we just talked about um, and went through in the interactive viewer. I really like this diagram because I think it illustrates that kernel being applied to an image and then kind of getting projected down into a single output pixel. And then uh, in the lower image, there is again, just uh, another mathematical example uh, where you can see with this filter, um, which again, looks like it adds up to one. Um, so that's going to be some sort of uh, like conservation of mass type filter, like a blur. And then we can see that filter applied to these values and the result is a negative two. So in GLSL, we're gonna be using a for loop. We're basically going to set up our neighborhood and say for every cell in our neighborhood, calculate the cell value, multiply it by a kernel value uh, for that cell and accumulate the results. All the kernels we talked about so far and all the ones that we're going to be using are three by three. Um, many of them fall into this three by three or five by five is also pretty common, but um, it is not completely strictly necessary for them to be any specific dimensions or even to be square, uh, but it is, I would say, vastly the most common to see square kernels. Uh, three by three or five by five is definitely the most common um, dimensions. Okay, so similar, a little bit different concept uh, is MIT maps. So MIT maps are really cool and really prolific in computer graphics. They are essentially a way to store different resolutions of a single texture and sample at various resolutions based on what's going to be best from a performance perspective. So if you think of an original texture as being 128 by 128, that'll be MIP layer zero or LOD level of detail layer zero. The first MIP map then will be half that size. So 64 by 64. The second MIP map will be half of that size or a quarter of the original, uh, so on and so forth. A lot of times this is used, uh, let's say in rendering terrain in like a game engine. If there is terrain that's really close up to the camera, it'll be rendered with, let's say, like a MIP0 uh, high resolution texture. But if we're rendering some terrain that's, let's say, really far in the background of a scene, like a open world mountain range kind of thing, and the mountains in the very far back will probably be sampled from a texture that has a uh, much lower resolution or like a, a higher level of detail because we simply don't need as much visual information uh, for something that's being rendered that far away. And it improves the optimization performance of our program quite a bit to sample uh, 16 as opposed, or 16 by 16, as opposed to 128 by 128. So it's really commonly used there, but it's also common to use in image filters and things like that, where we want to use different LODs in an interesting way um, to achieve a certain effect. So for example, a really easy hardware accelerated blur would be to simply sample something at a two or three level of detail, which would be, um, you know, reducing its resolution by four or eight X. And that will, especially if you then interpolate those values, um, look like you're blurring the image. So those are really handy. And it's something that I don't see used very often in touch designer, especially, but it's really good. Um, great for simulations, great for anti-aliasing and things like that. Um, definitely something good to know about. 
And so over on the right, I have obviously that mid-map diagram, um, but then on the common tab of your texture, any top, any top has this. The input smoothness, if you set it to mid-map, um, that will create these mid-maps and save them in the graphics card memory. And then we can use the texture LOD function in our shader to sample at a specific level of detail or a specific MIP layer. Uh, so in this case, we're grabbing our first 2D input and we're sampling it at our current VUV.ST coordinate, but we're using uh, MIP2, and that's what that 2 is at the end. So this is a texture that's a quarter of the size of the original texture that's being input. Um, so mid maps are great. There's so much literature out there um, on the internet about mid maps. So if you're interested in seeing other examples and learning a bit more about that, definitely go uh, give it a search. This is again, just the basics, but I wanted to make sure that you are familiar with this concept because it will doubtless come up and as this is a intro to GLSL, I want uh, as much broad coverage on some of these big topics as possible, even if we don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of all of them. And on that note, uh, this is just a quick aside. I want to basically just tell you the Convolve Top exists because it took me a while to learn about it. And the Convolve Top is great because it lets you define a kernel in a DAT and apply that kernel over an image really easily just by dropping the dat on the convolve top. So we can implement in this case, uh, something like a sharpen filter. Um, you could take any of the filters from the interactive um, convolution kernel website and implement them via a text dat and then use a convolve top to apply that to any input image. Um, the other thing I wanted to note is all GLSL tops and most other tops have this pass parameter, which will determine how many times per frame that shaders run. So if you want to execute something with multiple passes, that will uh, apply your shader iteratively uh, several times per frame, which is also just a useful piece of knowledge and something that may not be super commonly needed, but once you get to the use case where it is needed, it'll be good to know about. So I wanted to flag that as well. Okay, so that's all of our slides. Now we can get into the good stuff. Um, so we'll jump in to our image filtering advanced and let's take a quick look at what we're gonna be checking out here. Here's some examples of some of the filters we're gonna be looking at today. Now, from here on out, the rest of this video is going to be for my Patreon subscribers only. Um, so if you want to continue following along and are not a subscriber, head over to my Patreon. The link is in the description. Uh, subscribe. Check out this video as well as the rest of this course, all of the project files, the uh, solutions to the exercises for this course, and also all of the other tutorials that I have released in the past covering lots of topics on GLSL, Touch Designer, New Media Art, Houdini, um, lots and lots of, of good stuff. So head over to Patreon, subscribe, keep following along. And for those of you that are already members, thank you very much. And we can just jump into things.